By 650 BC, the Nubian kings, who had subdued Egypt, were ready to withdraw to the south, to Napata, and then to a new capital in their kingdom of Kush, at Meroe. And there we must follow them, if we are to understand the history of this inner Africa, which exercised so strong an early influence on ancient Egyptian civilization, and which later was to reflect that influence. The city of Meroe was situated a thousand miles south of the old Egyptian frontier, far into inner Africa. I never come here without a sense of wonder, for right ahead in the midst of this pitiless desert, there stands one of Africa's great historical surprises. The remnants of a lost civilization standing across the skyline as though shipwrecked on the sands of time. These are the pyramid tombs of the kings and queens of Meroe, who reigned and were buried here through more than six centuries. Long ruined by tomb robbers and by time, the pyramids are being restored and even reconstructed. Meroitic civilization still presents many puzzles. One is that the monarchs of Kush built their pyramid tombs long after such monuments had ceased to be raised in Egypt. Partly because the pyramids of Meroe are neither as old nor as massive as those of Egypt, it's been assumed that all this was a mere provincial copy of that greater civilization. In fact, it was far more than a copy. The similarities are there, but other aspects of Meroitic culture are found nowhere else. Another intriguing question is the relationship between the ancient people of Meroe, kings, queens, and citizens, and the modern Nubians who live in this region today. We can still see their stylized portraits in stone, but what did they really look like? I asked Dr. Ali Osman of the University of Khartoum. Oh, they look like me, of course. I am a Nubian. Uh, um, very much the, the Nubians of today are the Nubians of yesterday. We, we got to understand that rather carefully because the Nubian culture actually have not yet been very much ex explored. The Nubians from within, I mean, I the Nubian, what I do and how I behave, wouldn't have changed that much from what the medieval Nubians ha have done. But the influence that were coming on us as Nubians, uh, starting as early as you could say the Egyptian, and coming down to the Muslim and Arab influence have been changing. That does not mean that the Nubian have changed. But this identity has had to survive many foreign incursions and even conquests. At one time, Meroe fell before the invading armies of Aksum, another ancient kingdom high in the mountains of what is now Ethiopia. In more recent times, the Turks and the British have sent in their armies of occupation. Most lasting of all has been the influence of Islam. But through all these changes, the Nubians have done more than retain their identity. Just as they absorbed influences from elsewhere, so they too have had a deep cultural impact on their neighbors.
They build now as they've always built, in all probability just as the people of Meroe built, with an old effort-saving rhythm, constructing mud walls to defy the scorching heat of the Nubian summer. Their beds are no different from those of their ancient ancestors, like this one in Khartoum Museum, with a pattern of headrest which is much the same here and right across Africa as those of 5,000 years ago. And the traditional clan marks cut into this Nubian's face can be seen exactly reproduced on a stone relief which decorates one of the pyramids just a couple of miles away. It's been said that Meroe was the Birmingham of ancient Africa. And that wasn't altogether a flight of fancy, for the people of Meroe had a very extensive iron-making industry. Just consider this enormous pile of industrial waste, of slag. It proves that among the major activities of the people of this flourishing city was to smelt iron. And here is a bit of the residue. A few yards away stood the great temple of Ammon, Meroitic, although dedicated to a very Egyptian god. And somewhere in the sand, if I can find it, there's another remarkable fragment of inner African originality. Here it is, a stone inscribed with a fully operative script that was invented for the African language of Meroe in the 3rd or 2nd century BC. 23 signs for letters and a word divider. One of the earliest alphabetical ways of writing invented anywhere in the world and still a puzzle for modern scholarship. In wealthy houses surrounding the temple were found some of the comforts and enjoyments of Meroitic life. The style of these pots is uniquely Nubian and repeated nowhere else in the Nile Valley. Half a day's journey from Meroe by modern transport, a little further into the sand and rock of the Bhutana Desert, there stands another complex of stone buildings, this time dedicated to the gods of Kush and not to the gods of Egypt. Nowadays, this place is called Musawarat. Strange hints remain among the ruins, like this old lion in the sand. But what were these buildings for? Perhaps the kings of ancient Kush strolled beneath these colonnades. Historians have offered this or that explanation. My own is that the principal function of this unexampled and powerful building made it unique in the ancient world. This function, I think, was for the taming and training of the great African elephant. That seems to be the best explanation of the remarkable stone ramps which occur here, like this one, and that one over there, and another long one going over there. We can accept that the taming of the African elephant bigger and more difficult to handle than its Indian cousin, had become a speciality of the Kushites of Meroe. With their skills, they converted this, the greatest of Africa's wild animals, into the military tank of the ancient world. When Hannibal of Carthage invaded Roman Italy across the Alps, he had 38 war elephants in his army. The skills of the elephant trainers of Musawarat may well have contributed to that legendary feat. These temple walls provide a surprising reminder of much greener times with abundant pastures for domestic grazing. All that has vanished. As the desert advanced from the Sahara, the civilization of Meroe disappeared. Today, away from the banks of the Nile, only nomads can survive. 
This well has never been known to run dry. The scene is exactly as it was when I first came here some 30 years ago, and I doubt if it's changed very much in a thousand years. Proud and self-sufficient, these people seem untouched by the modern world. It's rare to see a single mass-produced item among their belongings, or anything made of plastic. It's as if they share a determination to rely on nothing but themselves and their animals. Visiting Europeans have usually made the mistake of judging the degree of civilization among different peoples by the number of their possessions. The ancient traditions of these nomads reach back to the very beginnings of history. And should they still remember their ancient gods, those too are still here, not yet swallowed up by the encroaching sand. Here at Naga, there's an even more remarkable mixture of local and imported influences. King Natakamini triumphs over his prisoners in a very Egyptian style. The python, on the other hand, was an inner African religious symbol regarded in many lands down to this day as a figure of spiritual power. And this representation of the lion god looks quite Indian with his three heads and four arms, but he too is uniquely Meroitic. The kingdom of Kush collapsed in the fourth century AD but evidence has recently come to light that some of its people migrated across the plains of Kordofan towards the Nuba Hills. Less influenced by Islam than the Nubians along the Nile, the people of this region have become of considerable interest to historians because they may be closer in their way of life to the Nubians of old. As it happened, we chanced on a special day among these Nuba people, a bit like a cup final. This is Africa as it can still be found, away from tourists, motor cars and big cities, celebrating in its own fashion. A number of cultural links have been found to suggest that these people may well share a common heritage with distant ancestors who lived in the time of the kings and queens of Kush. Village teams, each wearing its own distinctive color, have gathered from a wide area to take part in one of the oldest of all sporting events, but also a passion among the Nuba, wrestling. <laughs> So intricate are the rules governing not only the contest itself, but also exactly who may wrestle with whom on the basis of family relationships, that it's almost impossible for a visitor to follow all the moves. But for the historian, there's another close relationship between the Nuba wrestling of today and that of ancient times. Dating from around 2500 BC, these vivid paintings have been copied from an Egyptian tomb at Beni Hassan. Oh. 
Increasingly, it seems that these people can indeed trace their past back to civilizations in antiquity. And their ancient sport provides one more small piece of evidence of a continuous social tradition that's lasted for centuries. Yet these are the very people whom the 19th century explorer Samuel Baker described as human nature in its crudest state, not to be compared with the noble character of the dog. After the contest comes the celebration. Some of these Nuba girls may well be Muslim, but it's no part of their tradition to hide their faces behind veils. They have a pride and place within society, in line with the customs of old Nubia, and even of Meroe itself, whose rulers were often women. In another part of the Nuba Hills, just a few miles to the southeast, the teachings of Islam have made no headway at all. The people of these villages have quite consciously chosen to reject either Western or Islamic dress. Free spirits under an African sky, young girls dance as much for their own pleasure as for the spectators breathing life into these astonishingly similar images of Nubian dancing girls, performing for the pharaohs 5,000 years ago. Famed for their grace and beauty, they had an honored place in the life of ancient Egypt. That the one should still be regarded as primitive and the other as part of the world's cultural heritage reflects on the ignorance and prejudice of the modern world. And not at all on them. On the day that I visited Meroe, a pyramid was being rebuilt, not with the aid of bulldozers and cranes, but by the traditional techniques used in their original construction. As each great shaft of masonry was hauled up the ramp and pushed into place, for me, the continuity of African history was brought directly alive. The Egypt of the pharaohs did not spring whole and complete from its own local genius. It owed much to inner Africa. In the years ahead, more evidence will surely come to light which will emphasize that it's to the whole of the Nile that we must look, and to lands lying far in the interior for the source and origin of these great civilizations that have flourished along its banks. The last of these pyramid tombs was completed around AD 340. Then came a time of change. Meroe disappeared, and after the middle of the sixth century, this old civilization underwent another transformation, and one that brings us closer to our own world. 
From the north, Christianity spread south into the lands of Nubia. This was once the far-famed monastery of St. Simeon, near Aswan. The faded frescoes on the chapel roof can only hint at its past magnificence. But in the 1960s, by a stroke of great good fortune, the full glory of medieval Nubian painting was suddenly revealed. The story behind the finding and the saving of these wonderful mural paintings is almost a miracle. As the waters of Lake Nasa rose to engulf the old Christian Nubian city of Faras, archaeologists managed to dig down to the level of the long-buried walls of its cathedral founded in AD 707. And pulling away the dry sand, they saw what nobody had seen for centuries, these paintings and removed them in the nick of time. Now safely in Khartoum Museum, they glow once again with their distant message of art and piety. The Christian civilization of Nubia was one of wealth and comfort. A visitor in the 10th century, Ibn Salim al-Aswani, described the city of Soba, one of Christian Nubia's three capitals, as having fine buildings, spacious houses, churches with much gold, and cool, delightful gardens. He might well have added priceless works of ecclesiastical art. Splendidly preserved by the dry sand, these figures take us directly to the heart of Nubian Christianity. Here is the nativity scene with the Virgin and the Archangel Gabriel portrayed in the conventional style and unnatural skin color of the Byzantine church from which, of course, the Nubians took their beliefs. Over here are the three kings of Orient riding to Bethlehem, one of them clearly an African, and down here is a Nubian princess looking, I must say, very much like the Nubians look today. These are portraits of Nubian bishops. 25 of them were listed in Faris Cathedral as having succeeded one another from the 8th to the 11th centuries. The line might have stretched right up to the present day, so settled and secure did Christian Nubia appear. But it was not to be. This monastery did not simply fall into decay. It was sacked by the Saracens in the year 1172. The origins of that disaster lay not with the Christian Nubians, who'd been at peace for centuries with their Muslim neighbors to the north. The origins lay in Europe. The first of the great crusades, whose purpose was to recapture the holy places from the Muslims, set out in the year 1096. Many knights fought for God's purposes. Many others fought for those of Mammon. As one crusade followed another, those first high purposes became corrupt. The holy cause turned into a reckless rush for loot. Very soon they provoked a massive reaction. A holy war of Islam was launched under a brilliant Saracen general, Saladin. From his great citadel in Cairo, Saladin set out to crush not only the European invaders, but also, and this is something that a later world forgot, their African allies in the south. Historians have moments of bubbling excitement when they find proofs of something they'd only guessed to be true. I almost jumped for joy when I first saw this small wooden plaque from Nubia. For it's a unique proof of something that I'd guessed, 
that the Christian Nubians of seven or eight centuries ago also took part in the old wars of religion, the Crusades against conquering Islam. And here you see the crusader from Nubia with his cross, wearing chain mail and his sturdy steed, just as we in Europe can still see portrayals of our own crusaders. In this old film, taken half a century ago, Nubian horsemen can still be seen in their chain mail. The Black Crusaders of 800 years ago must have looked very similar as they gathered at fortified monasteries before setting out on that disastrous venture. Safe within his mighty Cairo citadel, Saladin was waiting to annihilate them. And there came an end to Christianity in these lands, an eclipse so final and complete that the world forgot, almost till now, that Christian Nubia had ever existed. Yet distant echoes of that long-lost epic can still be caught on the winds of history and in unexpected places. The Cathedral of Magdeburg, a famous capital of medieval Germany. From here, in the year 1228, the German Emperor Frederick led out his knights on the Sixth Crusade. And a few years later, a new statue was raised to the patron saint of Magdeburg, St. Maurice. Astonishingly, but beyond question, an entirely black St. Maurice. Until then, the many statues of St. Maurice around Western Europe had invariably shown this military saint as white. But here at Magdeburg, St. Maurice suddenly became black, unmistakably to my mind, the black knight of Christian Nubia, Christ's warrior from the distant south. So here his noble figure stands to this day, certainly the most important, perhaps the most moving sculpture of an African in all the history of European art. It was created and set up in this great German cathedral to honor the fame and virtue of an African friend and ally, different in face and form, but just as surely equal in dignity and human worth. <laughs> 